The title of our lesson this morning is The Promised Land of Dreams. Our first point is Living the Dream. Have you ever lived out your dreams? It's the most incredible thing. I remember growing up, I, I, had, I had two dreams. One was to be an Eagle Scout. And I made it. I made it. I was, I was like, I, I still remember this. I was so fired up to be living out the dream. Then my other dream was to be all conference in football. I didn't make it. And I was so down about that. But you know, when you're living out the dream, you know there's a sense inside of you that you're part of something beyond yourself. In Exodus chapter 3, in verse 8, we remember the dream that was given to Moses. God comes to Moses in the burning bush, and he says to him, I have heard the cry of my people Israel, and I've come to help them, and I'm going to take them to a land that is good. And spacious, a land that is flowing with milk and honey. Let me tell you something. When you're in slavery, that's a dream. That's a dream. And so began the exodus that accomplished God's dream. We remember the sadness of Numbers 13 when the Israelites, after two years of wandering desert, come to the border of the promised land. They send the spies on in. And yet the spies bring back... A majority report that says, we cannot do it. And the people are turned back and wander in the desert 38 more years. Moses dies. The Lord raises up Joshua. And they go back to the promised land a second time. And this time, they enter the promised land. And they start living the dream. They cross the Jordan River. Just like the Israelites before them had crossed the Red Sea on dry ground. They were living the dream. They came to the great city of Jericho with the walls that were high, double walls around them. And after walking around it six times for six days and seven days on the seventh day, the walls came down and they were living the dream. They had some setbacks, as with AI, but God gave them victory when they repented. Amen? Amen? They made some mistakes, like with the Gibeonites, because they forgot to pray before they made big decisions in their lives. And yet in the midst of all of this, when the Gibeonites asked for help, the Lord rained down hailstones to disturb those that would not hail Jehovah, but he gave them hailstones. Amen, guys? Let's return to that passage, if you would please, to Joshua chapter 10. Here in Joshua 10, the hailstones have come down. They've routed the army, and we read in verse 16 of chapter 10. Now the five kings had fled and hidden in the cave of Makeda. When Joshua was told that the five kings had been found hiding in the cave of Makeda, he said, roll large rocks to the mouth of the cave and post some men there to guard it. But don't stop. Pursue your enemies. Attack them from the rear. Don't let them reach the city. For the Lord your God has given them into your hands. These five kings formed the confederacy that was against Joshua and the Israelites. And in their fear, they ran into this cave and Joshua says, listen, we've got to go attack the people. Just roll some stones up on the mouth of the cave. We'll come back and deal with that situation later. Drop on down, verse 22. They go, they rout the enemy. In verse 22, Joshua says, open the mouth of the cave and bring those five kings out to me. So they brought the five kings out of the cave. The kings of Jerusalem, Hebron, Jarmuth, Lachish, and Eglon. When they brought these kings to Joshua, he summoned all the men of Israel and said to the army commanders who are with him, come up here and put your feet on the necks of these kings. So they came forward and placed their feet on their necks. Joshua said to them, do not be afraid, do not be discouraged. Be strong and courageous. This is what the Lord will do to all the enemies he's going to fight. Then Joshua struck and killed the kings and hugged them on five trees. And they were left hanging on the trees till evening. At sunset, Joshua gave the order and they took them down from the trees and threw them in the cave where they've been hiding. At the mouth of the cave, they placed large rocks, which are there to this day. That day, Joshua took Makeda. He put the city and its king to the sword and totally destroyed everyone in it. He left no survivors. And he did to the king of Makeda as he had done to the king of Jericho. You know, right here, we find an incredibly powerful moment. After routing the enemy, we find that they come on back to the cave, they take the stones away, and to bring the five kings that had dared defy 
the armies of the living God. Now, in the custom of that time, it would be for Joshua to have them lay on the ground, and as the victor over these kings, he would put his foot on their neck. But Joshua didn't do that because it wasn't about Joshua. This was all about God and all about honoring God's people. And so he said to his commanders around him, he says, I want you to put your foot on their necks. Because the commanders represented the people of God. And the people of God understood that God was not only with Joshua. God was with everybody. And they were to obey the command to annihilate everything. As the Bible says right here, to leave no survivors. Now for some of us that seems such a gruesome command. And yet for the Israelites to have the promised land, this was essential because... As we find out later in the book of Judges, some of the people were left there, and eventually those people became snares to their faith. They pulled them into their world. They pulled them by marriage to their gods, and they left Jehovah God because they didn't completely annihilate the people. Secondly, we find that if you leave some of these people alive, where you had slown some of their fathers and their aunts and their uncles, there would be a revenge motive. And so God says, listen, leave no Survivors. It's interesting to me, in the last part of chapter 10, that phrase, leave no survivors, is used in various forms eight different times. As Joshua literally goes from city to city to city in the great campaign of the south. In chapter 11, he goes to all the northern cities. And once more that phrase is used. In chapter 10, it's used eight times. In chapter 11, it's used six times. God was clear. Leave no survivors. Are you with me here? Now, there's a little footnote, though, at the end of chapter 11 I'd like for us to look at. At that time, Joshua went and destroyed the Anakites from the hill country, from Hebron, Debar, and Anab, from all the hill country of Judah, and from all the hill country of Israel. Joshua totally destroyed them in their towns. No Anakites were left in the Israel territory. Only in Gaza, Gath, and Asta did he survive. So Joshua took the entire land just as the Lord had directed Moses. And he gave it as an inheritance to Israel according to their tribal divisions. Then the land had rest from war. This is a very interesting footnote because we remember back to Numbers chapter 13. You remember when the ten spies came on back? And it says, we can't do this. The sons of Anak are there. You say, well, who are those guys? The Bible says that these people were, were huge in size. As a matter of fact, the Israelite spies came back and said, listen, we seem like grasshoppers to them. These were people of mammoth size. And, of course, you know, being a physical war and you have huge men coming against you, if you're only thinking in the flesh and you're man-focused, you're going to be afraid. Of course, Joshua and Caleb step up and say, the Lord is with us. We can surely take them. But it's very interesting right here that the, the Bible goes back. And Joshua, almost in passing, says, oh, yeah, and he took out all the Anakites, the giants. He took all, well, there were a few that survived. Some went to Gaza, some to Gath, and some to Ashdod. I find that very interesting. Because where does the most famous giant of all come from? Goliath. He comes from Gath. He was the descendant of these few people that escaped. No wonder his fury was so great against Israel. The revenge factor was there. Because the Israelites had not totally wiped out their enemy. Are you with me? As the people of God, this is a great parallel for us. Because as they had a mission to take the entire promised land, we have a mission as well. Turn to Acts chapter 1. Some of the very last words of Jesus spoken to the faithful 11. And he says in verse 8, But you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. He says, I want you to go everywhere, everywhere to the ends of the earth, preaching the message of the kingdom. And you say, well, what happened? Well, 30, day, 30 years later, we read this in the book of Colossians. In Colossians 1, 23, Paul writes, This is the gospel that you heard, and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven, and of which I, Paul, have become 
a servant. Our first century brothers and sisters got the job done. They left no survivors. Everybody heard about Jesus Christ in their generation. Does that fire you on up right there? You see, we can't leave anybody out. We can't leave anybody out. The Bible commands us, by example in the Old Testament, leave no survivors. And by example in the New Testament, that every creature under heaven had heard. You know, you may ask the question, well, how did, how did these people hear? Well, I think we get a great insight by turning to Acts in chapter 19. Here we just get a little porthole into the ministry of Paul. We read in verse 8 about Paul's ministry in Ephesus. It says this. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and public them aligned the way. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with them and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. Do you understand the magnitude right here of what was done in two years' time? The Bible says that Paul took some nameless disciples. These are, these are not the great apostles. These are just nameless disciples like you and me. He says, we're, we're going to be preaching the word every day at the lecture hall of Tyrannus. That's similar to the lecture hall at UCLA over there. Amen. And every day the disciples would preach the word. Now, then the Bible just simply says, as a matter of fact, two years later, all of the Jews and the Greeks in the province of Asia heard the word. What is the province of Asia? It's the whole western part of what we call Turkey today. Interestingly, it is also... That which is talked about in the book of Revelation to the seven churches of Asia. So that means in this two year period of time, the seeds of all of those seven churches were started. And of course, what's the first church mentioned in the book of Revelation? The Ephesian church. What's the church that springs out right here? The pillar church right here? The church at Ephesus. How did everybody hear? Well, the disciples preached the word every day. And they made disciples who made disciples who preached the word every day. And in two years' time, everybody in the province of Asia, both Jew and Greek, had heard the word of the Lord. They left no survivors. Are you with me here, church? Amen. You know, it, it, was, it, was, it was sad for us not to be able to be with you last week. But I, but I know that DJ preached the word of God. And, and I know that many people were touched. But we did have the chance to be able to go to the new planting in Chicago. And uh, it, it, was, it was just so exciting. Uh, we started the church there just a little bit less than a year ago with 16 disciples from Syracuse and four disciples from Portland. And now they've way over double. They have about 50 disciples. And what's incredible is the number of people that came out on Saturday morning, Saturday night, and Sunday morning just to hear about the gospel. Some of these people had never really heard about Jesus before. Some had kind of walked away from our old fellowship. Others were kind of in limbo between the old fellowship and what we're trying to do. But it was incredible as we preached the word. So many people are hungering. So many people want that relationship with God that they missed. What was really incredible is we laid it on out. And this one particular family I was really touched by, his name is Theo and his wife. And this is brother... He says, we have missed this. We just need some strong preaching in our lives. And it's really hurt because our daughter has drifted from the faith. But now she started coming to Chicago Church, and she loves it. The sisters are going after her, and it is awesome. And he says, also, my 18-year-old son, who's never been baptized, is now getting fired up. And I got a call from Chris on the way in today. Chris Broom's the preacher there. Their son is being baptized today as Theo and his wife are placing membership day. Is that flat awesome or not? See, we, we need to understand that God's vision goes way, way beyond a little local church where everybody is palsy wowsy with everybody. God is a dream. God wants the whole world evangelized. No survivors. No survivors. He wants everybody to have the opportunity to know. You know, if you could just take the Chicago church and drop it down right in the middle of this congregation, you wouldn't notice any difference. Because, see, disciples that have the same dream. Disciples that have the same commitment transcend all the differences of opinion. 
And when you're about a dream, there is a bond that comes. There is a, there's a sense of partnership that comes when you're about striving to change the world. You know, I'm from the so-called hippie generation. There's still a little bit of remnant of it. At least on the side, not on the top. And the thing about the thing about our generation was that, that we wanted to change the world. And when we didn't change the world, what did we start doing? We started getting into materialism. We start discouragement. You know, I am just so fired up that now churches are coming out everywhere. We have a new church now in Davao, Mindanao, Philippines. A small group of disciples have come out and said, listen, we want to be sold out disciples. We want to be a part of a worldwide movement that is going to take the world for Jesus Christ. My first question to you is, are you living the dream? Are you living the dream? Let me tell you something. If you were an Israelite back in those days, every Israelite knew what the dream was. We are flat going to take the promised land. There wasn't any clueless Israelite. So what are we doing out here fighting this war for? They all knew what they were doing. They wanted the promised land. And Joshua made it clear. These five guys hanging, they're the kings. That's what we're doing. Everybody, leave. No, survivor. I believe the first century church was equally bent on conquest. The first century church wanted the whole world to know. Jesus died for all men. Wouldn't God have a plan to get the message to all men? In two years' time, the entire province of Asia heard. How long will it take to get the message to Los Angeles, to Southern California, to the United States, and to the world? I believe that God, working through us, can do it in a generation. But i got to ask you, are you living the dream? Or are you living for yourself? Let's get back to the scriptures. Back in the book of Joshua. We come to a series of chapters that are, that are most fascinating. Chapter 12 lists out all the kings of the city-states that the Israelites conquered. I mean, it's incredible. 31 kings. I mean, they were bent on conquest. They left no survivors. And then in chapter 13, we read something very interesting. Verse 1. When Joshua was old and well advanced in years, the Lord said to him, You are very old. (laughs) And there is still very large areas of land to be taken over. You know, I'd never seen that scripture before. I mean, it would be kind of bad news the Lord comes to you. You are very old. But there was a sense right here that now Joshua is probably nearing 110, like when he dies. And the conquest of the promised land takes about seven years. And God says, hey, there's still a huge amount that's left unconquered. And there was a second charge that Joshua had besides conquering the promised land. It was allotting out to all the tribes their allotment in the promised land. Now, just to digress a little bit right here, in verses 8 and following of that chapter, we read about the two and a half tribes on the east side of the Jordan. When Moses was finishing up his leadership to come to the Jordan the second time, they took out some key kings. And two of the tribes, the Reubenites and the Gadites, asked Moses that they could just let their women and children be there, and they'll go into the promised land and fight. And so Moses says, okay... Reubenites, Gadites, and half the tribe of Manasseh, you can stay on the east side. But all the fighting men, they got to come on with us into the promised land. And that's exactly what they did. So that left nine and a half tribes to be able to divide things up. Now, you got to understand this. The Levites got no allotted land because their allotment, their inheritance was the Lord. Amen? But the Lord always works through number 12. And so what happened? The tribe of, so to speak, Joseph becomes two tribes, Ephraim and Manasseh. And so once more, there are 12 tribes to divide everything up. Manasseh's divided in half, 
Half of them live on the east side. The other half live on the west side. Now, let's read on a little bit further right here in chapter 14, verse 1. Now, these are the areas the Israelites received as an inheritance in the land of Canaan, which Eleazar the priest, Joshua son of Nun, and the heads of the tribal clans of Israel allotted to them. Their inheritance was assigned by lot to the nine and a half tribes, as the Lord commanded through Moses. Moses had granted the two and a half tribes their inheritance east of the Jordan, but not granted Levites an inheritance amongst the rest, for the sons of Joseph had become two tribes, Manasseh and Ephraim. The Levites received no share of the land, but only towns to live in, with pasture land for their flocks and their herds. So the Israelites divided the land just as the Lord commanded Moses. And so we find this dividing of the land in chapters 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, and 19. But there's a very interesting interaction right after the allotment had been given to Judah. Because the leader of Judah was none other than Caleb. Let's read chapter 14, verse 6. Our second point is keeping the dream alive. Verse 6. Now the men of Judah approached Joshua at Gilgal. And Caleb, son of Jephna, the Kenizzite, said, You know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God at Kadesh Barnea? About you and me. I was 40 years old when Moses' servant Lord sent me from Kadesh Barnea to explore the land. And I brought him back a report according to my convictions. But my brothers who went up with me made the hearts of the people melt with fear. I, however, follow the Lord my God wholeheartedly. So on that day, Moses swore to me, The land on which your feet have walked will be your inheritance and that your children forever because you have followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. Now, right here is a very interesting thing. What I really enjoyed about the scriptures is understanding the different portholes that we get to look at at different time periods. Right here, we begin to see that there was a conversation unrecorded in the Pentateuch, the first five books, between Moses and Caleb. There's a promise that Moses gives to Caleb because he had followed the Lord wholeheartedly. Now, let's read on right here. So we find right here that Caleb's now talking to Joshua. Now then, just as the Lord promised, he has kept me alive for 45 years since the time he said this to Moses while Israel moved about in the desert. So here I am today, 85 years old. I'm still as strong today as the day Moses sent me out. I'm just as vigorous to go out to battle now as I was then. Now give me this hill country that the Lord promised me that day. You yourself heard then that the Anakites were there and the cities were large and fortified. But the Lord helping me, I will drive them out just as he said. Then Joshua blessed Caleb, son of Jephna, and gave him Hebron as an inheritance. So Hebron has belonged to Caleb, the son of Jephna, the Kenizzite, ever since. Because he followed the Lord, the God of Israel, wholeheartedly. Hebron used to be called Kiriath Arba, after Arba, who was the greatest among the Anakites. Then the land had rest from war. This is, this is incredible right here, guys. For many years, I think people have preached this passage and said, you know, Caleb, this, this guy who at 85 years old comes to Joshua and he says, listen, you remember when I was 40 years old and I went in to spy the promised land and I came back and I gave a report according to my convictions. I didn't care what other guys said. It was my conviction because of my faith in God, we could take the promised land. Yes. On that day, Moses made me a promise. Now, remember, on that day, the people turned away. But then he says something that's, 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 that's amazing. People have said in verse 12 that Caleb says, Now give me this hill country. Or the King James Version is kind of cranky. It says, Give me this mountain. <laughs> and people have preached, Well, Joshua, because he was such a stud spiritually, goes to Joshua and says, Okay, God also says, I want to take the toughest area. Give me the hill country. Give me this mountain to let me personally assault. And conquer for God. But that really misses what this was all about. Yeah. See, the Bible is, is very interesting. It says right here in verse 12. Now give me this hill country that the Lord promised me that day. You yourself heard then. Oh my goodness. Joshua heard for the first time when he was having the conversation with Caleb about this. Wow. That the Anakites were there and their cities were large and fortified. Now, who are the Anakites? Those are the giants. And not only are they physically big, their cities are big and they are flat fortified. Interesting. I never picked this up. I had always had the vision 
that all the 12 spies just hung around together the whole time. That wasn't what happened. He says right here. He says, Joshua, you heard for the first time that day when I reported to Moses about what I saw in what became called Hebron, that yes, there's a big people there, the Anakites, and yes, they're well fortified, but I spoke according to my convictions. We can surely take it because the Lord will be helping me. Isn't that awesome? You say, well, what was so special? What was so special? The key lies down in two Hebron's earlier name. It's Kiriath Arba. Kiriath Arba was very famous. And I'll just give you a little background. In Genesis 23, Abraham's wife, Sarah, dies. She dies at 127. That's cranking. Amen, guys? <laughs> and Abraham, in love with his wife, says, I've got to give her a special burial place. And he goes to the Hittites there. And he says, I want to buy this plot of land. Because on this plot of land is a cave. And that's where I want to bury my wife. Well, that plot of land is Kiriath Arba. Later on, in chapter 25, verse 10, we find that Abraham is buried next to Sarah in that same cave. Later on in Genesis, in chapter 35, 27, we find that Isaac is buried in that cave. And then in Genesis chapter 50, verse 12, we find that Jacob is buried in that cave. This was a very special place. This was a, a sacred spot. This was where the patriarchs of Israel were buried. And when Caleb came to Moses, he says, I've been there. I've seen these pagan Anakites. I've seen their fortified cities. But let me tell you something. With the help of my God, we can conquer those pagan and drive them out of this sacred land. And now, 45 years later, he comes to Joshua. He says, listen, when I was 40, I spoke according to my convictions, and I'm going to do it again. Wow. See, I'm 85 now, but I'm just as strong and as vigorous about my faith as I was when I was 40. You see, he was keeping the dream alive. Wow. He says, I'm tired of these pagans occupying the sacred land of God for the patriarchs of heaven. I will take them. My God and I will drive them out. And the Bible later records, that's exactly what he did. That's exactly what he did. You know, I remember early on when we just first got the mission team here, the 1st of April. We went out to Mount Hollywood, which we renamed Mount Shalom. I mean, you know, they rename stuff in the Bible. We can rename stuff too. And, you know, it was, it was incredible, guys. The mission team was there. Everybody was pumped. I mean, they were going, oh, this is awesome. We are going up Mount Shalom. I mean, they were bouncing and fired up. I mean, even the old people were fired up. And, you know, the first half mile, everybody's bouncing. Then it was kind of funny how things started to kind of stretch out. Yeah, exactly, you guys. And for some reason, some of the brothers wanted to see the sights for a little while. <laughs> huffing and puffing as they were. And it was, it, was, it was very interesting. Because everybody came to understand that starting out is easy to be excited. It's easy to be strong and vigorous. But you get halfway up that mountain. You get three quarters of the way up that mountain. And to have the same strength and vigor that you had at the bottom is unbelievable. See, for a lot of us, we think that, that starting a Christian life, it's just going to get easier and easier as we go along. I mean, we're so excited today about... Our dear sister to be Dominique. Amen, guys? And you know something? I think what's going to happen is she's going to get baptized. She's going to come out. Whoa, this is awesome. She's going to be strong and vigorous. And yet there's a mountain to climb. It's called life. 
And the question to her, the question to you, are you as strong and as vigorous as you started out in the waters of baptism? Or have you flagged along the way? You know, Tracy was up here introducing Marty and Kathy. And mentioned casually just how old Marty was. He's 57. I know it. 55? Excuse me. And you know something? What, what Tracy was so fired up about is, here is a guy. 55. And he hasn't quit. Now, there are some temptations to quit. Marty and I were together yesterday just sharing. I, I, I appreciate Marty's transparency. And I believe whether you're a young Christian or old Christian, your life's got to be transparent. And you've got to have people in your life. But I just, she says, you know, bro, my, my, my faith left me. It got to a point where I didn't even read my Bible for two months. You know, when people start confessing their sin, I know these people are for real. Because we're all sinners. And, and yet, at the same time, he says, by going through that wilderness, that's when I found my faith. I had to have everything stripped away. And that's when you find out what your heart and character is all about. What Tracy was really in awe of, we need to be in awe of, is people that are climbing up the mountain of life and are just as strong and as vigorous as the day they were baptized. How about it? Is that you? Are you as strong and as vigorous as the day you were baptized? Or have you slowed down? Have you stopped? Have you quit? See, guys, we got to be keeping the dream alive. You know what, what brings Marty and me together? Dashing good looks? No. That is, that's just by chance. What brings us together is our God. And our dream to see this world evangelized. And there are a lot of things that, that Marty and I think differently upon. And that's okay. Because, you know, when, when you are focused on the lordship of Jesus Christ and, and calling other people to be sold out disciples, when you are focused on leaving no survivors in the entire world, you don't have much time to think about everything you have different. You're just thankful there's someone in the battle with you. Are you with me right here? See, that's what God needs is a group of people, a group of churches, a movement whose passion is the cross of Jesus Christ and whose motivating vision is the evangelization of the world. we got to keep the dream alive and be as strong and vigorous to defend the honor of our God all the way up the mountain of life. Let's go to our last point right here. Our last point is sharing the dream. You know, it's interesting in these passages that it's clear that Joshua handed out the allotments of land to the tribes while there were still many enemies of God inside of these lands. He expected all of these tribes to drive out the remaining peoples. In some cases, they did it, and in other cases, they didn't. For example, in chapter 15, verse 63, we find this record. Judah could not dislodge the Jebusites who were living in Jerusalem. To this day, the Jebusites live there with the people of Judah. And, of course, they weren't driven out until David drove them on out. So we do find this challenge to complete the job. And so we read this in verse 13, a very touching account. In accordance with the Lord's command to him, Joshua gave to Caleb, son of Jephna, a portion in Judah... Kiriath Arba, that is, Hebron. Arba was the forefather of Anak. From Hebron, Caleb drove out 
the three Anakites, Shishai, Ahiman, Telmai, descendants of Anak. From there, he marched against the people living in Debur, formerly called Kiriath Sefer. And Caleb said, I will give my daughter Aksa in marriage to the man who attacks and captures Kiriath Sefer. Orthanel, son of Kenes, Caleb's brother, took it. So Caleb gave his daughter Aksa to him in marriage. One day, when she came to Orthanel, she urged him to ask her father for a field. When she got off her donkey, Caleb asked her, What can I do for you? She replied, Do me a special favor. Since you've given me the land in the Gav, give me also springs of water. So Caleb gave her the upper and lower springs. You know, right here, we find that Caleb gets the job done at Kiriath Arba, at Hebron. He drives them out and leaves the sacred burial place of the patriarchs in the hands of God's people. But then there was another city. And the Bible says in this city, Kiriath Sephar, he says, listen, I have a bit of a challenge in my family. My daughter is unwed. And I want her to marry a cranking guy. Now, Dominique, I don't know if your dad should be taking notes right now or not. I, I just don't know. <laughs> and he tells all the people of Judah, all the guys, he says, listen, the guy that leads the attack and conquers carry a sephir. He will have my daughter in marriage. Amen. And the Bible just simply says, Orthanel does it. He was his nephew. You know, it's, it's a powerful thing because later on right here, as she's going to Orthanel, perhaps even on her wedding day, she's trying to get him to talk to her father. He must have been a little bit hesitant. I mean, it was Caleb. So she just gets off of her horse and she goes, Hey, Dad, you gave me the Negev. That was the, the special wedding present. Now, the Negev literally means in Hebrew, dry. It later became known as the word for south because the southern part of Israel is very dry. She says, Dad, I really appreciate the dry land you gave me, the Negev. But can we have some water to go with it? And like all dads, she had him wrapped around her little finger. And the Bible just simply says, and so Caleb gave her the upper and lower springs. Anything for you, babe. <laughs> all of you dads with daughters, you understand what Caleb did right there. That's just how it works. You know what's amazing? In Judges chapter 3, we find that Orthanel becomes the first judge of Israel. Sharing a dream. You see, Caleb understood something. He understood that he wanted his daughter to marry a man of faith. A hero. Because see, that's what women really want is someone who's going to fight God's battles, fight her battles, and be faithful to her all the days of her life. And as guys, we, we want a cranking wife. Our problem is we want the cranking wife before we become a hero. <laughs> and many a marriage has failed because of that. See, the Bible teaches quite clearly that sold-out disciples should marry sold-out disciples. We should not be yoked to unbelievers. You know, one of the special couples in the church here that Elena and I love as a, as a son and daughter is Vic and Aurora. And they just got married a couple of months ago. And, and their, their dream has always been to go into the full-time ministry. Now, I believe with all my heart, everybody's got a dream. Yeah. Full-time ministry may not be the gift set that the Lord gave you, but you still got to have a kingdom dream. Right. If you have nothing to live for, you have nothing to die for. Right. And all of us need a kingdom dream. Yeah. And it's really, really awesome because, you know, when we asked Victor and Aurora to come on down, I said, you know, Victor... We're very limited in our finances here at the church. I says, but listen, bro, I really want you and Aurora to come. 
You guys are heroes in the faith to all the young people. I said, here's the deal. We, we won't be able to but give you just a few thousand dollars. You'll have to work and do the ministry. He says, bro, absolutely. Absolutely. He's been working 35 hours a week at Noah's Bagel just so he could be down here and win souls for Jesus Christ. Well, the brother leaders and sister leaders, we got together last week, and we said, enough of Noah's Bagels. <laughs> Even though we really don't have the money, we got to put Vic and Aurora on full-time. So as of this week, Victor and Aurora are full-time in the Lord. Amen, guys? And I think, I think kind of, kind of as, as God does, you know, he just, God, is, God is so merciful. He just kind of reaches down when you're doing good and he gives you a hug. <laughs> See, I think it's what Dominic, a UCLA student, that's where they're working at primarily. That's what God's doing. He says, hey, here's a hug. Here's Dominique no. to show you that I am behind your dream and your marriage. But you know, that it, it just wouldn't be the same unless you had someone to share it with. Yeah. Now, I don't think sharing necessarily has to be with a wife or a girlfriend or a boyfriend or a husband. I think sharing a dream is special. You know, I think that's why Paul was so passionate about being with Timothy and being with Titus. You know, it's, it's just not fun if you're cranking a dream if you don't have anybody to share it with. Yeah. I look at Jeremy on over here. I mean, we have, we have been together the last four years and we've been just fighting the windmills and fighting the dragons yeah. and building Upside Down 21. And, you know, so many people have found sustenance in that. So many people have found hope. And, and there's a partnership that Jeremy and I share because of our dream that's brought us together. How much more powerful is that, though, when it comes to marriage? I got a question for you. Are you and your husband sharing a dream, or is one of you pulling the other one along? You know, after pulling some dead weight along for a long time, you're going to kill the person that's doing the pulling. You're going to kill them. You know, after we were in Chicago, Elaine and I were able to get away to celebrate our 30th wedding anniversary. And uh, many years ago... Uh, about 1981, we saw this movie called Somewhere in Time. And it's about time travel. And I won't go into all the details with it. But Elaine and I were doing lousy in our marriage, and, and we were just missing each other. You know what I'm talking about? You married people know what I'm talking about. We were just kind of missing each other. And we saw this movie where these two people are just together for three days. And it was a joy that made them last a lifetime. And they saw how special what they had. Well, after the movie back in 1981, we look over at each other and we're both crying because we missed our partner. I mean, you, you know what I'm talking about when you get that emptiness there and you don't have, you're not really sharing your dream? You know what I'm talking about? We're not talking about stomach cramps. We're talking about this emptiness right here. And, you know, I was... I was trying to come up with something cranky because the last six years have been very hard on us. And so last fall, I, I thought, I know what I'll do. I'll check out the hotel that's in the movie somewhere in time. It's the Grand Hotel. It's on a little island right between, you know, upper and lower Michigan. And it's the Grand Hotel. I go on the Internet, and the cheapest room for one night, $555. Well, we're not going there. Amen. <laughs> I don't know what it was. Something drew me back a couple months later, and they had one of those internet specials. <laughs> and I thought, could this be one of those things like those $99 tickets to London, and there's only one of them? <laughs> the internet special was incredible. For $200 a night, for three nights, you get not only this cranking room, you get this cranking breakfast. And you get a five-course meal at night. Now, this is the kind of place where you got to wear a coat and tie. you got to wear a coat and tie in the whole hotel after 6 o'clock. And I said, man, I can, I can afford that. And I went on and I go, uh, I knew it wasn't open. I put another cup that, that wasn't open. And then I hit three more times. It's open. Elena, come up here. And, and so it worked on out. And we got it. And so after Chicago, we, we drove on up. 
the next morning we took a ferry on over to the island and we walked into after you gotta understand there are no cars on the island just horse drawn carriages and so we get in the carriage and we're going up and, and I, I just feel this motion coming over me you know I try to be cool you know and I walk in the hotel and my, my eyes are watering I'm going oh wow this is bad you know and the lady goes what's wrong oh, nothing nothing we go to dinner I'm, I'm starting to tear up I, I, I just couldn't control it I was I was just so happy we were living a dream And when you're truly living the dream, there is an emotion that makes you cry. I told Elena, I said, you know, I haven't been happy, I mean really, really happy for a long period of time, for six years. And now I'm able to remember what a special gift I have in you. And I'm happy because I'm living a dream. You know, I thought about a song. It's too old for some of you guys. <laughs> but I thought about it. It's called, it's by Peter Cetera. It's called The Glory of Love. And I thought about Elena. It says, tonight it's very clear because we're both lying here. There's so many things I want to say. I'll always love you. I'll never leave you alone. Sometimes I just forget, say things I might regret. It breaks my heart to see you crying. I don't want to lose you. I could never make it alone. I am a man who will fight for your honor. I'll be the hero you're dreaming of. We'll live forever knowing together that we did it all for the glory of love. You keep me standing tall. You help me through it all. I'm always strong when you're beside me. I've always needed you. I could never make it alone. I'm a man who will fight for your honor. I'll be the hero you're dreaming of. We'll live forever knowing together that we did it all for the glory of love. It's like a knight in shining armor from a long time ago. Just in time, I'll save the day. Take you to my castle far away. I'm the man who will fight for your honor. I'll be the hero that you're dreaming of. We're going to live forever knowing together that we did it all for the glory of love. You know, our time here is short. When God came to Joshua and said, you are very old. (laughs) He knew that time was waning. Time is waning now. Some of us have marriages that are disgusting to God. You don't appreciate the mate that you have. You don't appreciate the hell they've been through married to you. Some of you don't really have a marriage because it used to be based on faith and now it's just materialism. And you wonder, where's the love? See, when you share a dream, it doesn't matter what kind of car you drive. It doesn't matter what kind of house you're in. It doesn't matter how nice your clothes are. What matters is that you're together. For some of you young people, you need to wait for your hero. Don't be choosing them because they look good, talk good, or smell good. You choose a man who is out for the honor of God. And you choose a daughter of God that's dedicated to God. And purity. One of the things that in talking to Marty, he says, Bro, I just want to be in a church that's known for its love. But you know, if our marriages are not known for their love, how can we be in a church that's filled with love? You see, to me, I'm blessed. I knew I was blessed. There have been long periods of sadness for six years. 
And yet it took me going to that castle far away, the Grand Hotel, (laughs) and remembering how blessed I am to be living the dream, keeping the dream alive, and sharing the dream of leaving no survivors but an evangelized world. Thank you and God bless you.